the final speaker of session, Dr. Jin Miao Chen, a principal investigator at A Star Singapore. He lab is focusing on single cell computational system and system immunology. Today, her talk is a benchmark of batch effect correction method for single cell RNA sequence data. Just welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Kujin, for a nice uh, introduction. And thank so you. Your voice, your voice is not that good. Yeah. Oh, my voice is not. It, how, how about now? Oh, better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, to, for coming to my talk. So I will share my screen now. I hope it's also showing on your screen. <laughs> not for screen. It, it, Okay, for now? Oh, okay. Okay, okay, let's go. So, uh, yeah, so today I will uh, introduce the one of the projects in my lab, which is a benchmarking study of the different batch effect correction methods for single cell RNA sequencing data. So to start with, I would like to borrow these uh, figures from Satish's lab published in Nature uh, 2019. So by doing single cell or mix, we are measuring almost everything at the single cell resolutions. We can do RNA sequencing, DNA sequencing. We can also measure the epigenomics and we can also measure the protein expressions either on the surface or either intracellular proteins. And the most recent uh, technology even allow us to record the spatial information together with either gene expression or the other uh, epigenomics or the genomics. So, with the technology developed, right, at the beginning, we are only able to measure uh, one modality of the cell, meaning that we either can only do uh, genomics or genomics or epigenomics. We cannot do uh, more than one uh, omics. But with the technology developed, we are now able to do multi-omics, meaning that we are able to either measure both, uh, for example, protein plus MRA on the same cells, or we're able to measure both the uh, MRI expression plus a toxic, uh, measuring the chromatin accessibility on the same cells. So with all these technologies uh, coming available, uh, scientists are generating a large volume of large volume of data. And these data are highly heterogeneous and highly dimensional, highly complex. And then with the technology developed, right, the, it becomes more accessible and the cost per cell also decreases significantly. So for nowadays, almost every lab is able to run uh, single cell analysis for their studies. If you can see this prop uh, since 2019, we can see that like, exponential increase in the number of studies that have using a single cell RNA sequencing. And then all different studies, they're using uh, different technologies. And then with different technologies, different labs are doing the uh, single cell atlas for even the same organs or same disease. So as a bioinformatician, so I, I wonder, with so many different uh, single cell atlas in from generated from different labs, whether we can come up with a consensus lab. And then in order to come up with a consensus lab, a data integration become a very, very critical. So for example, in this uh, uh, integration, we have data set one and data set two. In the data set one, we measure the gene expression of the cells and data set two measures the proteins. So usually we analyze them separately. So we form a damage reduction and uh, clustering using either the RNA alone or the protein alone. And then we arrive at these two uh, clusterings. And frequently we notice that these two clusterings don't really agree with each other. So we wonder which cluster we should take or we should trust. So the best approach is to integrate these two data sets into one uh, dimension reduction and the clustering. And then by doing that, we are, we are combining the power of the MRA and the, the protein expression into one uh, dimension reduction and the clustering. That is um, what we have learned from Satish's lab. We, by doing this uh, combined integrative analysis, we can detect um, subtler differences between the cells, which may allow us to discover new subsets and which also can allow us to to find the link between the different omics. So we 
by the, for example, by the MRI single cell uh, sequencing alone, we already know the diversity of the inner transatomics. By our testing alone, we also identify the heterogeneity at the chromatin accessibility. But little is not about the link between the diversities of the uh, transatomics and the diversity at the, at the genomics level. So data integration is very, very critical. And then actually, I think there are three types of data integrations. The first type is called unimodality per cell, and the data are generated from multiple batch. So in these two data sets, the features are the same, but the cells are different. And for this type of data integrations, uh, the research uh, scientists have come up with a lot of integration methods. And later on, I will uh, focus on this topic and then elaborate more. For the second type of modality uh, data integration is to integrate the multi-modality data per cell, which is uh, covered by uh, Satisha earlier today. So in this type of data integration, we have uh, the different modalities on the same cell, meaning the features are different, but the cells are identical. The different modalities are from the same cell. And for the third type of data integration, I think it's more challenging, which in which that where the features are different, between the data sets and the cells are also different between the data sets. And this integration is um, much more challenging because there's um, no link between these two data sets. The features are different, the cells are also different. But in the literature, a lot of studies have generated uh, a lot of data like this. So uh, a lot of them have generated uh, single cell ion sequencing as well as the single cell ataxic, but not on the same cell on the same sample, but on different cells. So the question will be, how do we uh, integrate these two data sets effectively and then to find the link between the modalities. But today, for today, I will only focus on the first type of data analysis, which is the unique modality per cell. And then we are integrating data generated from multiple batches. Yes, also, okay, so when we come to this type of data analysis, uh, data integration, the, the key challenge or critical challenge is the batch effect. So, for example, in the first, uh, this slide will show these three examples of uh, batch effects. In the first example, we found we, we, uh, the cells are sequenced in two different batches from the same samples using exactly the same technologies. However, we still see the cells from the two batches are well separated. And then if we don't look at the batch information, if we just look at the cell type information at the bottom, we might believe, we might mistakenly believe that we identify two subsets of PDCs and two subsets of uh, double negative density cells. And actually this is a false discovery of the new subsets. These two subsets is actually uh, due, is caused by the batch effect. And then in another example, which is the human PBMC data, in these two data batch, the data are generated from uh, two different technologies. One is TX3 prime, another is a TENS prime prime. And again, we see that the cells from the two batches are well separated, well separated. In another example, which is a mouse cell atlas, and the two data sets is generated by totally different technologies. One is a microwave seed, another one is a smart seed too. Again, we see, the cells are clustered nicely according to batch. So when we integrate the data, we, uh, we arrive at this uh, UMAP that we that the, the, the clusters we, uh, we observe, right, which is due to the batch effect. So we like to correct this uh, batch effect. Batch effect can come from uh, different technological uh, variations. It can come from like different capturing times or different handling personnel or different reagent laws or different equipments, animals or technology platforms. So all these will give rise to unwanted variations across these data sets, which we would like to correct for in the data integration. So I will just uh, use these um, uh, figures to briefly explain how batch effect correction is done. And this figure is borrowed from uh, the MAN paper, the Mutual Near Nearest Neighbor uh, Methods paper. And we can see that in the data, we have two batches, the batch one at the bottom and the batch two on the top. And between the two batches, we have two common cell types, which is the red color cells and the blue color cells. These two cell types are commonly present in the two batches. We also see the, the purple colors and the 
yellow colors, these two cell types are unique to only either batch one or batch two. And then we, we see the two batches, we see uh, batch effects between the two batches. So what the algorithm can do is that they use the common cell types, which is the red color and the blue color to calculate uh, so-called correction vectors. And then using these correction vectors, they pull down the batch two data so that the common cell types in the two batches can be well aligned. And more importantly, the unique cell types still remain separated after the integration. So now let's see after the batch effect corrections, whether we can uh, merge the batch and still keep the cell types uh, separated. So in this example, after the before the integration, we can see the cells are well separated between the batch, but after you can see that the cells from the batch one and batch two are well uh, mixed. And more importantly, the cell types still remain uh, well separated. And you can see the PDCs, the PDCs from batch one and batch two now are well aligned and mixed in one location, in one clusters, while those specific clusters, such as a CD141 and CD1C, they still remain uh, separate, although they are from different batch. So in order to evaluate how good a batch effect correction methods is, we need to uh, check whether the batch are well mixed and whether the cell types remain are well separated. And in the other two examples in the human PBMC, again, we see the cell types, the cells from the two different batches are well mixed and the cell types still uh, remain uh, well separated. And although the data were generated by a different uh, technologies, still the algorithm are able to remove these uh, technological variations and then merge the same cell types into one clusters after the cell type, after the data integration. And then this is just a, a result from one uh, batch effect correction methods. Actually, there are more than 14 methods out there. And what we see here is the performance of uh, 14 methods. In the first column, we see the, the, the data, the UMAP, before any batch effect corrections. You can see that the cells from the two batches are well separated. And then after we apply the SREC2 or SREC3, you can see the, 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 the batch are well mixed and the cell types are, are still are well separated. And then we also see that another few methods such as Harmony, FASTMN, and MN Correct, and a few methods at the bottom column are able to uh, produce a similar performance to remove the batch effect. However, we also notice that some methods, for example, are combat. Although it's able to pull the, the, the data, the cells from the two batches closer compared to the raw data, they're able to pull the two batches closer, but still can see a clear separation between the two batches. And then another method is Lima. Also, the performance is similar to Combat. Actually, Combat and Lima was uh, initially developed for bulk analysis data. And here we just apply it to single cell uh, data. And although it can remove the batch effect to a certain extent, but still we can still see the, 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 the separation between the, the batches. So by visualization, we observe that different methods are produce a slightly different uh, performance and slightly different results. So we like to, um, to, um, to quantitatively assess the performance. So that's how we, that's why we come up with uh, these uh, four quantitative benchmarking metrics, including uh, average uh, suhoret width, adjust range index, local inverse and symptom index, and k neighbor batch effect test. We used all these four benchmarking uh, metrics to quantitatively assess the performance of all 14 different methods. So you can see in the ASW uh, plot, in the x-axis, we calculate the ASW uh, cell types. In the y-axis, we calculate the one minus ASW batch. So the bigger value the x-axis is, the better performance, the better, uh, the better separation between the cell types is. And the bigger values on the y-axis, meaning the better uh, mix between the batches are. So the good performing methods should appear in the top right uh, corner, while the raw data should appear in the, in the uh, bottom left 
regions. So you can see a number of methods, right? Did a good job. All of them is better than the raw data. In particular, some of the methods are really good. They can, for example, on MN correct harmony strategy, they can produce a good uh, self-type separation as well as a batch mixing. And similarly, we can uh, examine the ARI plots in a similar way. So those methods appear in this top right regions are those uh, good performing methods. And then for SL for Lysi, similarly, we can see that some methods such as Liger, Shrek 2, Shrek 3 are the top performing methods. And KBAT is slightly different. KBAT are, are we in KBAT in the x-axis, we plot the sample size, the down sample size. In the y-axis, we calculate this uh, one, minus, one minus k bet, which represents the acceptance rate. So the higher acceptance rate means the better performance of the methods. So we see the raw data has a very low uh, acceptance rate, but the good performing methods such as uh, Ligers and uh, Shrekchi has a good k bet uh, matrix. So by using this, uh, by integrative using four uh, matrix, we are now uh, able to uh, assess the, the performance in a more objective way. And then, and based on this approach, right, we perform these uh, benchmarking studies of all 14 different methods. We apply all 14 different methods to perform batch effect corrections on the data. And then using the batch effect corrective data, we plot a diagnostic plots either using a TISNI or UMAP. And by visual inspection of the TISNI or UMAP, we can, uh, we can uh, qualitatively assess whether the batch effect correction is uh, done properly. In addition, we also use a benchmarking uh, quantitative matrix to calculate these four metrics of each of the methods. And then based on these four metrics, we can uh, assess the performance in a more objective way. In addition, we know that DG analysis between the clusters is a one key step, one key downstream analysis of single cell analysis. So we would like to assess the inference of battery effect correction on the DG analysis. To do this, we simulate the data with the non DGs, and then we do the DGs on the batch corrected values, and then compare the DGs with the branch of DGs, and then based on that comparison and the accuracy, and then we uh, we can assess which methods can improve the DG analysis by uh, removing the batch effect. And then in order to perform a comprehensive uh, uh, assessment, we run this uh, benchmarking on 10 different data sets. These 10 different data sets cover both human and mouse and covers the different tissues, different organs and different cell types, and even covers a wide range of uh, technologies. And then in, in these 10 data sets, we like to cover five scenarios, which you may encounter in your uh, research, in your studies. The first scenarios we, uh, we designed for is the identical cell types uh, across, uh, in different batch, and, and different batch is sequenced by different technologies. For example, data set two and five. In these two data sets, we, the cell types are identical across batch, but the data are generated by different technologies. And the second scenarios we cover is the non-identical cell types, which is more challenging compared to the first one. Because if the cell types are non-identical between the batches, we might uh, mistakenly merge those uh, cell types that are only present in one batch with those cell types only pre present in the other cell types. We, that's why we want to avoid that. And in the third scenario, we uh, evaluate the performance on the multiple batch, for example, like three batch, five batch, and even like, for example, more batch, like which is which make the task even more uh, challenging and difficult. And then also look at two big data sets, which have almost a one million cells. And then the last data set we look at is the simulation data to look at the effect on the DG analysis. Okay, then, uh, I would like to skip all the uh, the details in the, set, in the in the benchmarking studies. I would like to uh, summarize our findings in this plot. So, as we mentioned earlier, we use four uh, metrics to evaluate the performance of different methods. So, for each of methods, we will rank the methods. We will give a ranking to the methods 
from good performance to low performance. And then we do a rank sum. We do a rank sum to sum the rank of each methods across four, uh, across four uh, uh, benchmarking metrics. And then based on that uh, ranking, and then we rank sum again across different data sets. Across different data sets. And then we, based on that rank sum across data, uh, different data sets, we rank these methods from uh, uh, good performance to poor performance uh, from the uh, bottom to the top. So we see the raw data before the before the batch effect corrections. We see the performance is the poorest, and uh, the, the 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 best performing methods is actually a prof, uh, appear in the bottom of this prop. And then for uh, we can see that at the bottom we have harmony, Liger, and Syrup, which we uh, based on our study we believe that is the top three uh, performing methods. However, during our study we also noticed that. There's no one single method always perform the best across different data sets. That's why I also give them a ranking for each of the data sets. And then you can assess so that the users can assess their data sets to see whether their study is similar to uh, which of these uh, different data sets so that they can uh, select the best methods for their, uh, their specific studies. So for example, in data set, data set two, and that the height, the height here represents the performance of the each methods. The lower bar height means the better performance. So in data set two, harmony is the best performing methods. Shred true is the second uh, best methods. And MN correct is the third uh, uh, best methods. And if you look at another data set, which is data set seven, in this data seven, actually Liger is the best performing methods. And there's estimate, uh, MM correct is the best methods. Yeah, so so based on these graph, right, uh, the, the users can uh, assess the, uh, can select the best methods from for their specific studies. And then another um, uh, a perspect, uh, aspect of the methods we need to consider is the efficacy, whether it takes a lot of memories or whether it takes a lot of time to finish the analysis. That's why we also uh, measure the memories of each methods. And then we can see that different methods require a different amount of memories. For some of methods, for example, VPKN, it requires very, very few uh, message uh, memory usage. But for some methods, for example, FASTMN and uh, uh, SE Merge and the Street 2, it actually has a lot of uh, it, it, it take up a lot of memories. And in terms of time, uh, in terms of time, the time will uh, increase if your sample size increase. So we look at data set eight and data set nine, which is the two largest data sets. And then the colors here represents the time consumed by the different methods. As we can see here, PPKN has, is the fastest, is the, the fastest method to complete the analysis. and. It's also the, the methods that require the least uh, amount of memory. And other methods such as Liger, uh, SC Merge, Shred Tree, and SGN, and MN Correct, requires a, a long time to complete analysis. So you can, we can also, like, based on these two assessments, we can pick the methods based on the, the service you, you have and based on the time constraint that you have to just pick the right methods for your uh, uh, research. And then lastly, we like to assess the effect of the battery effect correction on the DG analysis. And in order to that, we simulate the data. We simulate the data with different uh, drop up rates and different batch size. And then we run the battery effect corrections and use the corrected uh, metrics to perform a DG analysis. And then we can we do this by either using all the genes or only highly variable genes. When we compare the performance by the F, F score, you found that the raw data, the F score is, uh, is pretty low. And interestingly, after batch effect corrections by some methods, the F score actually even uh, decreased after the batch effect corrections. But on the other end, also see that some methods do produce a good F scores, such as uh, uh, combat, MN correct, ZB wave, and SE merge. So these methods are really produce a good F score on DG analysis. However, interestingly, these methods are not the 
top ranking matters, uh, top ranking matters by the uh, assessment in terms of the efficacy. And then the reason is because I think, in my opinion, is because all these the top performing matters here, their output is actually not a mean. It's not a. It's not a corrected value. It's actually is a, a corrected vectors. So these corrected vectors, right, doesn't represent the expression level of the genes. While these methods combat like compare MN correct or simply wave or as merge, the corrected values actually represents the true uh, level of the gene expression. That's why it performs well on the DG uh, analysis stage. So just to quick, uh, sum quickly summarize the findings. So for the batch effect corrections, what we found is that harmony, ligand, and syrup are the top three methods. And in terms of the efficacy, harmony is, is fast, and then followed by LIGA and then uh, SHREC3. And then in terms of DGs, we found that COMBAT, MMM correct, Zimbi wave and Zimmerge are the top four methods. And, but the, the, the questions here is that the two sets of uh, top performing methods doesn't overlap. So what should we do? So based on my uh, uh, understanding of the, the methods, right, I would recommend to combine the two methods into your analysis. So when you do a dimension reduction of clusterings, you can use a harmony like a surect to form a nice uh, dimension reduction and clustering. But when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to uh, DG analysis to compare the different clusters, we can use those uh, corrective values derived from either combat MM correct or Zimbi wave or SE merge. And then the story doesn't, doesn't end here because I feel that there's a lot more challenge out there. So for example, recently we encountered this uh, challenge when we try to integrate large number of batches. The end is, is uh, greater than 50. So uh, we found that this, um, the current uh, the package is not able to uh, integrate very large number of batch. We are working on that, try to improve that, try to combat that issue. Another challenge is that which is the third type of data integration, which is the data come from uh, different modality and also come from different cells. So the no share features, the no share cells, nothing is linked. So how do we integrate this type of data? So I think there will still a lot of things the, for the computation part to work on to further improve the data integration uh, methods. Yeah, I think that's all from me. Thanks, thank you for listening. I would like to take questions. Thanks for your talk. So we uh, can have two questions. The first one is, must uh, the two samples have the same, same cell types for performing batch correction? Uh, and, I'm not. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you, 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 you can make first ask this one. <laughs> yes, yes, okay. yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, uh, no, the two batches can have uh, different cell types. So the algorithms, uh, it doesn't need to have the same as any cell types, but at least we require some common cell types between the, the, the batches. So they can use the common cell types to calculate some, uh, some like uh, correction vectors or like transfer vectors to, to move these two batches to, to into one uh, dimensions. Yeah, so the data, the, the cell types does need to be identical, but it required to have at least one or two cell types are shared between the batches. Yeah, so I, I can just answer the second one, how to avoid eliminating biological variants during batch correction. I think it is hard to dis discriminate the batch effect and the meaningful biological variants. I think no matter the can, discriminate the two effect, right? <laughs> so uh, we have another question. Uh, it's really great to see systematic benchmarking on this method. So how do you deal, deal with uh, the study of uh, transition cell types, such as response data, as drug response data, how to deal with this kind of problem? Uh, yes. Yeah, I think this will be more challenging. I think this will be very, very challenging if the the cell types is like on uh, uh, they're on like a uh, transitional spectrum. It'd be very, very difficult to for us to 
quantitatively assess the performance of the batch effect corrections because even by like one in one batch, the cell type uh, identification cannot be 100% sure. So I think this one be very, very challenging task for the transition cell types. Yeah, and we haven't done that, uh, done that on that aspect. So um, the last one, why were all measures not, not compared for differential expert gene analysis? Uh, so, okay. Yes, because, uh, because uh, it doesn't make sense to run um, uh, the DGs of the harmony and Liga because uh, in harmony, actually the output from harmony is actually uh, some kind of uh, vectors that are similar to PCA, PCA principal components. So it, it, it is not recommended to run uh, a DG analysis on like a PCA or like CCA vectors. And similarly, uh, this applied to LIGA. So after LIGA um, batch evacuation, the output right is actually these uh, uh, vectors we call uh, uh, non-negative uh, factor, uh, uh, a metric factorization metric uh, uh, vectors. So these vectors, right, is already a, a transformed metric, transformed feature. It doesn't represent the original um, gene expression. So that's why we didn't perform the DGNSS for these two methods. Okay. 